Yes, sir. Okay, so good uh, afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so I have a big pleasure to introduce Jan Scherz. Um, as you see, there are three, three affiliations, and it is because he's, uh, he was a PhD student on, on the basis of Kotutel, so he was as a PhD student at University of Duisburg, together on University of Charles University, and also working with me, which means that there is also an institute of uh, mathematics, academy of science, and today he will speak about his, uh, his thesis, which means everything what is written here, big solution for this uh, mathematical models for this uh, interaction between fluid solid and electromagnetic fluid solid. Please. Okay, so thank you very much for the kind introduction. And of course, also thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. And um, yes, as Shaka said, I will uh, talk about my PhD thesis. Um, mainly, I will repeat my talk from my defense just a couple of months ago, but with a few more details today. And yeah, also, as Shaka said, my PhD was a joint project between the Charles University here in Prague and the supervision of Barbara Benesova and the University of Würzburg in Germany and the supervision of Anja Schlimmerkämper. And also, I had a lot of support from the uh, Mathematical Institute of the Czech Academy of Sciences, where I was working on the Shark. And yeah, the title of my thesis was Good Solutions to Mathematical Models of the Interaction Between Fluid Solids and Electromagnetic Fields. And so let's just get started right away with the mathematics. Um, yeah, what we are interested in here in all generality is a three way interaction problem. We consider some electrically conducting fluid. We consider some uh, solid structure, for example, immersed into the fluid, and in the ideal case, also electrically conducting and elastic. And also, we consider the electromagnetic fields present in these two materials. And in this setup, uh, the fluid and the solid interact with each other mechanically. Also, the motion of the fluid and the solid uh, influences the behavior of the electromagnetic fields. This is essentially what Ohm's law is telling us. And vice versa, these electromagnetic fields produce some forces which then act upon the fluid and the solid. But of course, such a highly coupled problem is very ambitious, and it is more in fact than what we have been able to handle at least so far. So what we're actually doing is we study two specific subproblems of this general setup. And these two subproblems are first uh, the motion of an insulating and rigid body through an electrically conducting fluid, and uh, second, the evolution of a magnetoelastic material. Today, we will go through both of these problems. Uh, first, we will always start with the model we use for the mathematical description of the respective situation. And we are always interested in weak solutions to the model. And our main result for both problems will prove the existence of the weak solutions. And in the end, I will always say a few words about the main ideas of the proof of the respective result. And of course, we start with the first one of the two problems, fluid rigid body interaction in an electrically conducting fluid. We can see the situation here, where we have some time t greater than zero and a bounded spatial domain omega in R3. And by q, we denote the corresponding time space domain. And at any time lowercase t from zero to capital T, the domain omega is filled with the fluid f of t and the rigid body s of t. The fluid is assumed to be electrically conducting, so it has strictly positive electrical conductivity sigma. And therefore, we have here these positive and negative charges in the fluid, while the rigid body is assumed to be insulating. So its electrical conductivity sigma is just equal to zero, and there can't be found any charges in the body. Okay. And uh, similarly to the domain omega, we also split the time space domain Q into a solid part QS and a fluid part QF. And for these types of problems, there are also uh, several interesting applications, for example, in biomechanics. And one particularly interesting example we can mention here 
is the so-called problem of uh, rebound struct delivery. Um, in rebound struct delivery, the fluid would be blocked in the human body here in red, and the rigid body would be some very, very small capsule-shaped device containing some medical drug. And the idea in remote drug delivery is that through the application of some external electromagnetic fields, uh, the drug in this capsule can be transported directly to the area of the human body where it is needed, so that healthy tissue in the human body will not be affected by the drug. But this just to give you some idea about what type of situations we are talking about here. And yeah, then let's focus on the mathematics and let's continue with the model views for the uh, mathematical description of such a situation. And we start with the description of the fluid, which we here assume to be incompressible. We have also done the compressible case, but due to time reasons, uh, I will mainly focus on the incompressible case today. And just in the end, I will say a few words about what changes in the compressible set. And uh, yeah, so we have here the incompressible Navier Stokes equations. So we're looking for a velocity field U, uh, density rho, and a pressure P, which satisfy here the classical continuity equation and here the classical momentum equation. And in the momentum equation, we notice that besides some given external forcing term G, we have a second forcing term, 1 over mu curl of E times B. And this is, in fact, not an external force because here B, the magnetic induction, constitutes another unknown from our overall system. And so this whole term, 1 over mu curl of E times B, uh, represents a reduced form of the Lorentz force, which shows the influence of the electromagnetic fields on the motion of the fluid. Then these equations are supplemented by here the classical no slip boundary condition for the fluid velocity, and here the corresponding no slip interface condition on the fluid solid interface. And in particular, this last condition here also shows uh, the influence of the solid velocity on the fluid velocity. Then we proceed with the description of this solid velocity, for which we have the balance of linear momentum and the balance of angular momentum. These two equations, they determine the translational velocity V and the rotational velocity W of the rigid body, respectively. And the important thing to take away here is that these equations show how the motion of the rigid body is driven entirely, on the one hand, again, by this external force in term G, and on the other hand, by the Cauchy stress of the fluid. But this Lorentz force, which we saw on the previous slide, plays no role here, which is because, as, we, as I said, uh, we assume the rigid body to be insulated. OK, and then the overall solid velocity is given as the rigid velocity fields down here, namely the translational velocity V plus the rotational velocity W times X minus the center of mass capital X of the rigid body. OK, then it only remains to discuss the behavior of the electromagnetic fields, for which we have the Maxwell system. So here we see the Maxwell equations in both the fluid and the solid domain. And our unknowns here are the magnetic field H, the electric current density J, the electric field E, and of course, again, our magnetic induction B. These equations are then supplemented, first of all, by Ohm's law here which shows the influence of the fluid velocity on the behavior of the electromagnetic quantities. And we also see that since the electrical conductivity sigma vanishes in the insulating solid domain, that the solid velocity actually has no direct influence on the behavior of the electromagnetic fields. Then next, we have this very important linear relation here between B and H via the magnetic permeability U. And here, um, yeah, let me point out that this relation considered separately in both the fluid and the solid domain is just a standard assumption. But we here assume that U is actually a constant in the whole domain, meaning that it takes the same value in both the fluid and the solid domain. And this is an assumption made for purely mathematical reasons, which we can see here below in our interface conditions on V because namely the classical interface conditions here would state that 
the normal component of B is continuous across the fluid solid interface, and the tangential component of H is continuous across the interface. But if in addition we know that B is equal to mu times H with mu constant across the interface, then these two conditions imply that actually B itself is continuous across the interface, and this is exactly what we're stating here. And the reason why we want such a relation is our variational formulation of the problem later, where we want B to be a solar function over the whole spatial domain. Okay, and the remaining um, boundary and interface conditions stated here, they are just classical and can be actually derived from the Maxwell system itself. And yeah, then there's one more important point here, which is that in fact, in the conducting fluid region, our whole electromagnetical subproblem here can be reduced into one single relation, this so-called induction equation for the magnetic induction B. And the point is that once B has been determined from this induction equation, all the other unknowns from the electromagnetic system here will be immediately determined as well in some trivial way from the remaining equations. And so from a mathematical point of view, actually, the induction equation is the only equation we later really need to take care of. Good. So this summarizes our model. And then in order to perform some mathematical analysis, we also need, of course, a variation formulation of the model. For this, we start by introducing two specific test function spaces. First, the space C for the momentum equation, which consists of functions with a vanishing symmetric gradient in a neighborhood of the solid domain. This reflects upon the fact that the solid is a rigid body. And similarly, the space Y for the induction equation, consisting of functions that are curvy in the neighborhood of the solid domain, reflecting upon the solid also being insulated. Okay, and the important thing to notice about these uh, test functions is that they depend on the solid domain and therefore on the overall solution to the problem itself. And this is kind of bad because it causes the problem to be really highly coupled, and this will later cause our main difficulties in the mathematical analysis. But now let's really continue with the weak formulation. And so we say that a weak solution to our problem consists of an orientation preserving isometry eta, which describes the motion of the rigid body, the density rho, the characteristic function chi of the rigid body, the velocity field u, again with vanishing symmetric gradient in the solid domain because the solid is a rigid body, and the magnetic induction B, again with vanishing curl because the solid is also insulated. And of course, we want these functions to satisfy certain equations, which we see here on the following slide. So first of all, the characteristic function chi and the density rho need to solve the transport equation associated to the velocity field u. Then this variational formulation of the momentum equation is supposed to hold true for all test functions from this uh, specific test function space C we introduced earlier. And this variation formulation of the induction equation needs to hold true for all test functions from the corresponding test function space Y. Okay. And now, before we turn to our first main result, which proves the existence of such weak solutions, let's first have a brief look at the already existing literature. So, here we see just a very, very short selection of articles. Of course, there are many, result, many more results already available, but yeah. Today, I will focus on the most crucial ones for our specific work. So let me first point out that the purely mechanical interaction problem between fluids and rigid bodies, but without any uh, electromagnetic fields involved, has already been extensively studied, for example, here by Edward Feilweiser. And the same can be said for the interaction problem between fluids and electromagnetic fields without any solid structure. For example, here by Remisa. And then I should also mention the work by Guermo and Mina, who really studied the interaction problem between um, an insulating rigid body, an electrically conducting fluid, and the electromagnetic fields trespassing both of the materials. However, in their case, this rigid body was assumed to be immovable. And now we come and we study the same problem, but with a freely moving rigid body. So what we do 
is uh, we prove the existence of weak solutions to the interaction problem between a freely moving insulating rigid body, an electrically conducting fluid, and the electromagnetic fields present in both of the materials. And our specific main result here looks like this. So under certain kind of standard assumptions, we find the time t prime greater than zero, such that on the interval zero until t prime, our problem indeed admits the existence of a weak solution in the sense we specified earlier. And this weak solution additionally satisfies uh, the energy inequality displays down here. And also the existence time t prime can be chosen as the first time at which there occurs a contact between the body and the boundary of the domain. Okay. And then, as I said earlier, uh, we will also have a look at the proof of the result. So um, the main idea of the proof is to use some approximation method, meaning that we first consider an um, uh, approximate problem, which is kind of easy to solve. And then after solving this problem, we recover a solution to the original problem uh, by passing to the limit in the approximation. And our specific approximation here consists of three different levels. First, we use a time discretization via the water method. This um, helps us to decouple the system, that allows us to deal with these solution dependent test functions in the induction equation. Then, in order to handle the corresponding test functions in the momentum equation, we use the so called Brinkman penalization. In the Brinkman penalization, the rigid body is approximated by a permeable but still rigid object. So we start with the fluid in the whole domain. And then at first, we can solve the momentum equation with classical test functions. And the velocity of the rigid body is determined separately as a projection of the fluid velocity onto a rigid velocity field. And then in the limit of the permeability going to zero, one can check that actually the limit of the fluid velocity coincides in the solid domain with the rigid velocity of the body. And yeah, this method is already well known. It has been analyzed rigorously here, for example, by Boss, Cote, and Matra. And yeah, then finally, we also use some regularization techniques, which uh, help us to solve the approximate system and to pass to the limit in the time discretization. And yeah, while the Brinkman penalization and the regularization techniques here are very classical, the main novelty in our proof lies in our specific use of the time discretization here. And so this is the part which we want to have a closer look at today. So as I already said, we use this time discretization in order to decouple the system, which then helps us to deal with these test functions in the induction equation, which as you see here again, depend on the solid domain and therefore on the overall solution to the problem itself. And the idea with the discretization is that it allows us to solve the equations one after another. So in particular, at each fixed discrete time, we can first determine the position of the rigid body, and then we can solve the induction equation. And for the specific implementation of this method, we choose some small time step delta t greater than zero, and we split the time interval into discrete times k delta t. And then at each discrete time, we search for a discrete density rho delta t k, a discrete velocity field u delta t k, a discrete magnetic induction v delta t k, and the characteristic function chi delta t k of the rigid body, which are then supposed to satisfy a corresponding discretized version of the problem. And the first thing we notice here is that this characteristic function, chi delta t k here, is not actually a discrete function, but uh, time dependent on this small interval k minus 1 delta t until k delta t. So what's going on here? Well, I already said that chi delta t k should be the characteristic function of the body. So we wanted to take only the values 0 and 1, so that at each fixed time, we can always tell exactly what the position of the rigid body is. And of course, this behavior can be guaranteed if chi delta tk solves the classical transport equation, but it seems that we might lose this property if uh, the transport equation is discretized. And for this reason, 
we decided uh, that we want to construct Kaidel ZTK immediately as a time dependent solution to a classical transport equation looking something like this. Here are these small intervals, k minus 1 delta t to k delta t. And this is good because once chi delta t k has been determined from this equation, um, we have the solid domain at the time k delta t given as the set of all x in which chi delta t k at the time k delta t takes the value 1. And then with the solid domain attached, we can turn to the induction equation where we now consider discrete test functions curled free in this given solid domain. And with the test functions given, it then really becomes a routine matter to solve a discretized version of the induction equation looking something like this. Here for simplicity, I just omitted some of the regularization terms we use in our approximation, but it's really easy to see that with uh, some slight regularization and with these test functions given, uh, this equation here can be solved just via some standard coercivity argument. Okay, so this summarizes how we deal with these uh, solution dependent test functions in our induction equation. And yeah, that's all I have to say for our first proof here. And then let me tell, just say a few words now really about the differences in the compressible case, because in the compressible case, we have studied the same problem. And again, we have proved the existence of weak solutions. And our proof here is some kind of extension of the proof of the, uh, in the incompressible case, now with uh, five different approximation levels instead of three. And yeah, first of all, the reason why we have more approximation levels is because in the compressible setting, we now need to use this whole classical uh, existence theory for the compressible Navier Stokes equations, which itself already consists of three different approximation levels. So now here, in addition, we have a Galeacan method in order to solve the momentum equation. We have this parabolic regularization of the continuity equation, and we add some artificial pressure term to the momentum equation uh, in order to increase the integrability of the density. Then in order to deal with these solution dependent test functions in the momentum equation, uh, we now cannot rely on this Brinkman penalization anymore because the Brinkman penalization is really designed for the incompressible case. But we can make use of another classical penalization method um, in which, again, we start in an all fluid setting. So, first, again, we solve the momentum equation with classical test functions. And then, here, the rigid body is approximated by letting the viscosity of the fluid rise to infinity in certain parts of the domain. And the main novelty in the, this, in the compressible setting again lies in the time discretization, because again we need a time discretization in order to deal with the test functions in the induction equation. But in the compressible case, such a time discretization causes some additional problems. Or more precisely, it seems that. Uh, ah, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, the discretization seems to cause some additional problems uh, because. Um, ah, sorry. Okay. Yeah, confused about it. How long how to hide it? This? Which one? Ah, this one, yeah. Uh -huh. I think I can't turn to the previous slide. So, so, okay. 
that's okay. So again, um, this discretization uh, causes additional problems because it seems that um, some of these uh, classical techniques for compressible flow uh, do not transfer to the discretized setting. And in particular, we have not been able to discretize the whole system in uh, such a way that um, non-negativity of the density can be guaranteed. And then we were not able to derive the uniform bounds um, for the discrete solution. But we can recall that already in the incompressible setting, we did not actually, actually discretize the whole problem because there we had this transport equation, which we immediately treated as a continuous problem on these small intervals between consecutive discrete time points. And here in the compressible case, we now want to extend this approach. Namely, we in fact only discretize the induction equation and we treat the whole mechanical part of the problem immediately as a continuous problem on these um, small uh, time intervals. Yes, and in this way we can really handle the induction equation exactly as in the incompressible case, while we can still apply all of these um, classical techniques for the compressible Navier-Stokes equations. Good. Now that's all I will say for the compressible case. And um, yeah, so that's also all for the first problem. So let me just quickly summarize this part. Um, so here we have now been studying this um, interaction problem between an electrically conductive fluid and insulating rigid body, and also the Maxwell system in both the incompressible and the compressible case. And in both cases, we prove the existence of weak solutions. In the incompressible case, the main idea of the proof was this three level approximation scheme. Uh, with a time discretization via the water method, an approximation of the rigid body with the Brinkman panelization, and also some regularization techniques. And in the compressible case, we just extended this proof um, with, in particular, a modified time discretization. And down here, we just see our published results in both the incompressible and the compressible. Okay, then I'm really finished with the first problem, and we can turn to the second one which was the evolution of a magnetoelastic material. So here may be first of all the question, what exactly is a magnetoelastic material? Well, such a material is in particular elastic, meaning that it deforms under the application of mechanical stress, but it returns to its original shape once the stress is removed. And we see this situation here, where we have such a material in its um, reference configuration on the zero, with Lagrangian coordinates capital X. And the deformation of the material is represented by a mapping eta at any time t, which maps omega zero onto the corresponding current configuration omega of t with Eulerian coordinates lowercase x. But of course, the magnetoelastic material is not only elastic, it is also ferromagnetic, and so it has a magnetization m tilde. The tilde here stands for the fact that it is represented in the reference configuration. And um, this magnetization stands in mutual interaction with the deformation. Mainly, the magnetization also changes under the application of mechanical stress, and vice versa, the material deforms when exposed to a magnetic field. And yeah, for uh, applications of such materials, um, just as one out of very many examples, we can again think of this uh, remote drug delivery problem from earlier, where such materials can be used as an alternative, alternative uh, method to steer or control this uh, very small capsule with the medical drug. But again, let's focus on the mathematics and let's uh, continue with the model we use for the mathematical description of such an evolution. And here we start with the description of the deformation eta via the equation of motion. And the first thing we notice is um, that here, for reasons of mathematical simplicity, we are neglecting any inertial effects. So the first term we actually have here is the divergence of the first pure Lactatius stress tensor sigma. Then in the back, we essentially just have some given external forcing terms. And down here, the equation is supplemented by some boundary condition on some part of the boundary of the reference configuration. And the interesting part here, of course, is the pure Lactatius stress, which is specified by this formula. So 
with divergence is equal to the Cauchy derivative of some energy potential uh, e tilde with respect to eta plus the derivative of some dissipation potential r tilde with respect to dt eta. These two potentials are specified down here, so let's have a closer look at them. First, um, the energy is composed of an elastic energy and a micromagnetic energy. In the elastic energy, we first have the elastic energy density W, onto which we later impose some more restrictions. Then we have one over the determinant of the deformation gradient to the power of some A. And we have the second deformation gradient to the power of some of some Q greater than the spatial dimension. And yeah, here the reciprocal of the determinant of the deformation gradient, of course, has physical relevance because it guarantees that the material cannot be infinitely compressed. But also this term, together with the second deformation gradient, has a very important mathematical meaning because these two terms together give us a very high regularity of the deformation, which in particular allows us to freely transform between the reference configuration and the current configuration. Then in our micromagnetic energy, we start with the anisotropy energy density psi tilde. Again, we will impose some restrictions on this later. Down here, we have the exchange energy, which models the effect that the magnetization of a ferromagnet tends to align in one constant spatial direction. And the term down here penalizes the magnitude of the magnetization, taking values far away from the, from the saturation magnetization, which here for simplicity is just chosen equal to one. And also we have the spray field H here, uh, which is determined separately via some Poisson equation with the divergence of the magnetization on the right hand side. And in the dissipation potential, we first just have the uh, this term, which models the viscosity of the material. And the second term here is kind of interesting because in this term, we see that it's actually independent of dt eta. And so when we look at our equation for the pure lactation -like stress, we notice that this term actually has no influence at all on our equation of motion. And so at this point, this term seems to be kind of useless, but actually it plays a crucial role in the second part of our model namely uh, the magnetic force balance for the description of the magnetization. This equation is now um, formulated in the current configuration. And for this reason, we now also write M instead of N tilde for the magnetization. And the first thing we notice about this equation is that it is not actually the full landau lifshitz gibbert equation, which is typically used for the description of uh, the magnetization but again, a simplified version for mathematical reasons. And the next thing we can see is that we already recognize most of the terms in this equation from our um, energy and dissipation potentials on the previous slide, except for maybe this term DTM down here, which is specified like this, and which constitutes the transport of the magnetization. And our question at this point is if it's possible to express the, uh, the magnetic force balance here in terms of the same energy and uh, dissipation potential as the equation of motion, despite this uh, additional transport term here, which does not appear in the equation of motion. And um, the answer to this um, question turns out to be yes, we can do this. Um, thanks to this uh, second term in our dissipation potential down here, about which I earlier said that it seems to be kind of useless. But if the term is transformed into the current configuration and then uh, differentiated with respect to the transport, we obtain exactly uh, this desired transport term in our magnetic force balance. And yeah, then we are really able to just um, write our energy and dissipation in terms of the variables from the current configuration. And then we can express this magnetic force balance in the form down here. And therefore, in particular, really in terms of essentially the same potentials as the equation of motion. And this will later play really a crucial role in our proof. Um, OK, but before we can think of any proof, we first need, um, again, a variation of formulation of the model. And for this, we start by uh, making some more conditions and introducing some more notation. So first of all, in order to avoid self-penetration of the material, we restrict here to deformations 
of this set E here of so called internally ejected deformations. These deformations, they satisfy the CLA matchup condition, which is good because this really guarantees us that they are injected, except for possibly on the boundary of the reference configuration. Then, as already mentioned before, um, we impose restrictions on the elastic energy density W and the anisotropy energy density psi tilde. Or more precisely, first of all, we have this coercivity constraint here on W. Uh, which is chosen in such a way that the second deformation gradient in our energy really gives us regularity of the deformation in the corresponding subvolume space W2. And we have these growth conditions here on W, psi tilde, and their first derivatives, which are chosen just in such a way that we can later carry out all the necessary limit passages with the help of the meta U convergence theorem. Good. And now, with the preliminaries at hand, we can really state our variation <coughs> relation. So here, a weak solution to our problem consists, of course, of a deformation eta and a magnetization m tilde, or m, depending on whether we express it in the reference configuration or the current configuration. Um, these functions, of course, need to have a certain amount of regularity, which is specified here. And uh, they need to satisfy this uh, variation of formulation of the, of the equation of motion and this variation of formulation of the magnetic force balance. Um, yeah, so this is uh, not too special. It's very similar to the strong formulation, just in some distributional sense, of course. So we don't need to think about this too much. And then again, before we turn to the next main result, which again proves the existence of such weak solutions, let's first have another um, brief look at the embedding of our work into the already existing literature. So um, again, we see just a very short selection of articles. There are, of course, many more results available already. But um, I would say the specific starting point for our work was the article here by Barbara Beneshova, Walter Kampschulte, and Sebastian Schwarzacher, who used um, a specific implementation of the George's Minimizing Movement Scheme in the study of some fluid structure interaction problems. And we decided that we want to apply their approach to the study of some uh, specific model of magnetoelasticity derived down here in this PhD thesis of Johannes Foster. And of course, there are already some existence results available for this model. For example, here by Johannes Foster himself, Barbara Beneshova, Junio, and Anja Schlimmerkamper. Um, I will say a few words about the main differences of our work compared to uh, these results in a minute. But first, let me also mention the work here by uh, Marco Cresciani, Elisa Davoli, and Martin Kuschek, who um, also studied a very similar model to ours, but they had um, a rate independent transport term in the dissipation potential, whereas our transport term is quadratic. Okay, and then uh, really concerning our work. Um, first of all, as we have already seen, we also need to make some restrictions in the analysis. Uh, so the first thing we had was, uh, yeah, we do not study the full knowledge of the equation, but as we have seen, a simplified version in the form of some gradient flow equation. Then uh, we have neglected inertial effects in the equation of motion, so we're in the cross-aesthetic setting. And also our energy depends on both the second deformation gradient and the reciprocal of the determinant of the first deformation gradient even though this last dependence, of course, also has some physical justification. But anyway, um, under these uh, restrictions, we are then also able to obtain some nice novelties. So first of all, in uh, comparison to, this, uh, to these results based on the model by Johannes Foster, um, these previous results, they always uh, solve for only an approximation of the deformation gradient. Here, we are able to solve for the deformation gradient itself. Uh, second, um, in these previous results, one always considered deformations which preserve the shape of the considered material. We are here able to uh, consider uh, deformations which also change the shape. And moreover, we consider compressible materials. And um, yeah, while our energy is convex with respect to the second deformation gradient, it's not necessarily convex with respect to the deformation itself. Uh, yeah, as already said, also in comparison to the work by Marco Cresciani, Elisa Davoli, and Martin Kuschek here, uh, we have in our dissipation potential a quadratic transport term instead of a rate independent one. 
Good. And then our specific result looks like this. So again, under certain assumptions, the most crucial ones of which I think we have now seen before, um, we find a time t prime greater than zero, such that on the interval zero until t prime, our problem indeed admits a weak solution in the sense we specified earlier. And also the existence time to prime here can be chosen either as infinity or as the first time at which the energy blows up or as the first time at which there occurs um, a self-contact of the material. And then again, let's have a look at the proof of the result. So as I already said before, our proof here is based on a specific implementation of the George's minimizing movement scheme in the work of Barbara Beneshova, Martin Kampschulte, and Sebastian Schwarzacher. So let me first uh, briefly recall the scheme. So in this method, again, we split our time interval into discrete times uh, k delta t. But now at each uh, discrete time, we do not solve discrete approximations of the original equations directly but we rather solve a minimization problem and then we obtain discrete approximations of the original equations as the euler lagrange equations associated to the minimization problem. And in the end, again, we recover a solution to the original problem uh, by passing to the limit in the discretization. Okay, now one might ask um, why, in fact, do we need the minimizing movement scheme here? And well, the reason lies in the non-convex energy in two points, actually. First of all, in general, coupled systems of PDEs are often solved uh, with the help of fixed point arguments. However, fixed point arguments um, often rely on uh, convex energy, which we just don't have in our case. So this approach is kind of out of question for us. And um, in the minimizing movement scheme instead, fixed point theorems can be avoided because uh, we determine all the, all the unknowns from the system simultaneously by solving only one minimization problem at each discrete time. Okay, but then one might still wonder, why don't we use the same approach as earlier in the fluid which is body interaction problem, where we also had a time discretization, but we used it to decouple the system and then solve uh, the equations one after another and directly instead of minima via minimization, and well, the reason is that with this approach, there's another issue. Um, namely, in this approach, in order to get uh, uniform bounds for the discrete solution, we would test the equation of motion by a discrete time derivative of the deformation. And then we would have to use a discrete form of the chain rule, looking like this here for the energy E tilde. However, such an estimate can only be guaranteed if E tilde is convex here in its first argument. And again, this is not the case for us. And so also this approach will not work in our setting. But in the minimized movement scheme, um, an energy estimate for the discrete uh, solution can actually be obtained in a very natural way. Namely, we can just compare the functional F delta T K tilde here uh, from the minimization problem in its minimizer to the same functional evaluated in the minimizer from the previous discrete time. And then the desired uniform bounds follow simply by summing this inequality over all the discrete times. And yeah, so this summarizes why we are using the minimized movement scheme here, because it allows us to deal with the non-convex energy. Good. And then just for the specific implementation of this method here, now at each uh, discrete time, we search for a discrete deformation eta delta tk and a discrete magnetization m delta tk tilde uh, as a minimizing pair to a suitable functional f delta tk tilde. And what I mean here when I say suitable is that the Euler Lagrange equations associated to the functional need to give us good discrete approximations of uh, the equation of motion and the magnetic force balance. And at this point, it also becomes clear why earlier it was so important for us to formulate both of these equations uh, here in the continuous setting in, um, in terms of the same energy and dissipation potentials. Because now what we can do for the minimization problem is we can model this functional F delta T K tilde after these potentials. Or more precisely, we said F delta T K tilde equal to um, the energy V tilde 
plus the discretized version of the dissipation R tilde, plus discretized uh, versions of our external forcing terms here. And then it really turns out that taking the variation of F delta TK tilde with respect to eta, we obtain a suitable discrete approximation of the equation of motion. And taking the variation with respect to M tilde gives us a good discrete approximation of the magnetic force balance. And yeah, for this reason, uh, we are then really able to recover a solution to the original problem once we pass the limit of the discretization. Okay. So this is also all I have to say for the proof of our uh, last result here. And uh, yeah, so let me just briefly summarize the second part. Um, so now here we have studied the evolution of the deformation and the magnetization of the magnetoelastic material. And again, we have proved the existence of good solutions to the problem. Our proof here was based on the George's minimizing movement scheme in order to handle the non convex energy. And in this scheme, in the discrete minimization problem, the functional could be modeled after the energy and the dissipation from the continuous system, thanks to the fact that in the continuous setting, uh, both of our equations could be really uh, formulated in terms of the same energy and dissipation. Okay, so now I'm really coming to an end. So yeah, now what we have done all together is prove the existence of weak solutions to two problems. First, fluid which is body interaction in an electrically conducting fluid. And second, the evolution of the magnetoelastic material. And yeah, so that's all I have to say. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We have a very nice talk. So questions and answers. Please go ahead. Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much for a nice talk. So you mentioned that um, 